I want to begin just with a couple of slides and give you some insights into nanofabrication and MIT Nano, and then we'll dive into doing something in the lab. Um, but I want to start out with the following question. So ask yourself if the following would impress you. If you could raise your travel speed from that of a garden snail to about 0.4% of the speed of light. Now, I'd love to do this. This would certainly impress me. Um, uh, that is a 10 million fold increase in speed that I would love to gain. I know it's not realistic, it'll never happen, but these kind of increases have actually happened in the past in other fields. Um, but before we go there, um, just a quick introduction. My name is Jörg Schalvin, Assistant Director for User Services at MIT Nano. I'm actually an MIT class of 2000, course 61, and then did a PhD in ECS as well. Um, and that picture is from my freshman year uh, in the snowstorm in April. So 10 million times increase in performance, in size, in some relevant metric, um, that has actually happened. And it has happened in the semiconductor industry. So what you're seeing here on the left, this is the first transistor invented in Bell Labs in the 40s. And then on the right, this is a not even more the most modern type of device, but a relatively modern transistor that you find these days, right? Going down to 10, 20 nanometer feature sizes, right? So that 10 million fold increase is what you actually have seen in this kind of industry. And in fact, many of you probably have heard of Moore's law, but um, basically what it says back in the 60s, uh, Gordon Moore speculated that or postulated that uh, the transistors will double every two years uh, for at least another decade. So really just a very, very little bit at the bottom of the, of the graph. And what is really amazing to me is that it kept doing that over and over for decades to come way beyond the prediction, right? This exponential growth of capabilities, right? In this case, what's plotted here is the transistor count. So the complexity of your circuit. With that comes an improvement in speed, a reduction in size, all other kinds of things that come along with that. Okay. So that is Moore's law, that is the semiconductor industry. Um, and perhaps just to give you a reference point again for, for more modern electronic devices, things you may have in your cell phone, in your computer, um, these have feature sizes on the order of 10, 20 nanometers in the horizontal and in the vertical often atomic precision layers, very, very, very thin layers of specific materials. And um, what, what perhaps the best way to illustrate this is not only can you make something small, but you can also make many, many of them for a very, very low cost, right? What other area is there where you could say, give me a few billion objects for $100, right? That would never happen anywhere else, but it happens here in the semiconductor field, right? And that allows you to have that computational power in mobile devices, in data centers, et cetera. Now, at MIT Nano, we don't build these kind of devices. They're too complex. Uh, that's something that industry is good at. What we do though, is we use the same kind of equipment that you may use in an industry fabrication facility. And um, we benefit from those advances. So as time goes on and the industry creates better and better equipment, we utilize those advances. And what do we do? Well, we essentially are traveling orthogonal to the path of the industry. We apply these techniques to new applications. And by that, I mean, we may study and modify materials. We may create new devices and we may apply them to uh, completely new disciplines. Right? So that is sort of branching off and exploring new worlds that go beyond just the straight path that the industry perhaps has been taking. And you know, before we start running through the lab, just another quick overview. The NSF National Science Foundation actually came with a really nice definition of nanoscale. It's not just where stuff is small. That would be the, the sort of the easy, the obvious definition. But the NSF said, well, um, nanoscale is where quantum effects dominate the property of materials. It is where much of biology occurs and where surfaces and interfaces play a large role in the material properties. So what that means really, if you think about it, is when you make something so small that fundamentally something new happens. It's not just shrinking it and making it better, but 
actually doing something to create a completely new physics, completely new effects that we can then utilize. So what I'm gonna do now is go off camera um, and we'll uh, briefly look through the lab here. Uh, and then we'll discuss what we're gonna do. Now, by the way, you can unmute yourself and ask questions throughout. I have a speaker here that, that somewhat works. So um, I might ask you a couple of times what you mean, or you can put something on the chat and, and we'll get to that. But chat tends to be a little bit harder for me to read from, from, from a distance here. So don't be shy to unmute. We don't really have too many people on the call. Um, and uh, if you object later, we'll edit it out of the recording. Okay, here's the deal. So if you don't wanna be on the recording, we'll, we'll cut that out. Um, so where I'm actually at now here at MIT Nano, this is the first floor um, and we have the camera on a little tripod so I can drag you guys around. I'm, uh, I'm just gonna roll a little bit and then we'll um, reposition ourselves. So to give you a sense for, for how this whole building is organized, a clean room is, we're gonna talk about later what defines a clean room and what creates the, a clean um, environment and why we need that. But um, you know, what we have is essentially a clean space. I'm wearing a bunny suit. We'll understand later why I'm wearing a bunny suit here, this funny outfit. Um, and then uh, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be building something. Now, in principle, what we're trying to do today has many parallels to what you may find in a research device, even in a uh, industrial process, but we don't have you know, five weeks to build something significant. So we're gonna have to figure out what to do in, in just a matter of, of two hours or so. And um, um, you know, we, what we're gonna do is we'll take a Zoom screenshot later and I'll, I'll explain you how we're gonna do that. And then we're gonna fabricate that onto a wave. But standing in the clean room here, you'll notice a couple of interesting things, right? There's filters up above. Um, there are essentially air comes out, there are cutouts over here. If you look far in the distance, air then returns and the whole clean room is shaped like an E. Um, users and tool operation happens on the fingers and the gaps in between the E is the what's called chase, the operational part where perhaps the backside, all the utilities are at. So where I'm in, this is the user space. Over here, this is the operational space, right? And we separate that to make sure that we don't contaminate the operational space from, from the, with the, or the user space with the operational space. Now, let me, uh, there we go. To give you a sort of a, a diagrammatic view of, of where we are at um, and what, what things are about. Um, in the clean room, we want clean air, clean water to not contaminate the devices we're using and building and we want stable temperature and stable humidity. Stable temperature is important because any change in temperature, optics and materials shift in size that can become very problematic. Stable humidity is often important for reproducible chemical processing. So all of that is necessary uh, and we can put numbers to that. We could say the particles in the air will have to be 10,000 times cleaner than regular air. Water has to be 10,000 times cleaner than regular water. And we got about a two degrees Fahrenheit stable temperature and 5% and in humidity. And this is what the whole clean room looks like, kind of what you saw behind me already. Right? We are here in this user space. Air is filtered above through HEPA filters and then runs down the length of the clean room. So it comes down like a shower from above. Um, and it does so in what's called a laminar flow. So it actually flows perfectly parallel. And then it scoops up with it any dirt that gets contaminated, maybe things that I create here, um, and then recirculates and gets refiltered. And this process is done actually 250 times per hour. So every 15 seconds, the air that I'm in is completely removed and refiltered. Right? And that's been great over the last two years, I guess, because you're working essentially in a, in a perfectly filtered, always clean environment. Um, and that has been a great help uh, during, during times of COVID here. Right. Have our filters above, laminar flow generated from that. And then we have, of course, fans that recirculate all of that. And at the very end of the tour, we'll look into a little bit photos of what actually is above me here and behind the scenes. 
Uh, we can't roll there, but uh, we can certainly look at what it looks like um, you know, if we were to go there. Now, this is what we're gonna do now. This gets important. Um, we're gonna make a zoom wafer. Um, the way we're gonna do this, we're gonna break us up into a couple of different breakout rooms, uh, maybe three or four, six to eight people per room. Um, one person designated in your group can take a screenshot, um, email it to me. Um, so there's my email. Um, and then when you're done, you can come back. Just to lay the foundation of what it is we're building and what the wafers are that we're looking at. So we're building things on a silicon wafer. Um, and in fact, if I go out of this here, um, if I look at it, um, a silicon wafer is, you know, we're looking, we have this following problem. We're looking at dimensions that can be nanometers in scale, but we have a very similar problem on earth. What does this picture show? Well, this is a cross section of the planet, right? Maybe a slice of that. Um, I got the crust on the top and the ocean and the mountains and all that. And at the bottom, I have the core, cross section of the earth. But um, well, where's all the excitement on the earth? on top of the surface, at least in my opinion. So uh, we don't draw it to scale. Right? We don't draw this picture to scale because we would just draw the core for forever and the top surface would have absolutely no relevance in that drawing. So you know, if the action is on the surface, what does a person look like in this kind of drawing? If it was to scale, well, a person, let's say for simplicity is two meters um, versus 6 million meters of bulk material underneath. Right, that is a about three million to one ratio. Right? And that illustrates this complexity, this problem of drawing both the earth in its entirety plus the people on top of it, right? You got these orders of magnitude that you possibly cannot fit into a single drawing. And therefore you give up and say, I'm not gonna draw it to scale. I'm gonna draw it in an arbitrary scale that makes sense that shows what I wanna show. On a silicon wafer, on the substrate that we will be building our devices and that all the semiconductor industry is founded, it is actually very similar. Here's a six inch silicon wafer to scale. It looks like a flat disc. And um, where's all the excitement at? All your transistors, all your devices, all your metal wiring, all of that is on the surface. So again, for the same reason we don't draw earth to scale, when we look at people in the surface, we don't draw the silicon wafer to scale. If I were to zoom in into that chunk of silicon wafer, about half a millimeter thick, um, I would eventually get to the very, very surface. And on the very surface, I would find these tiny, tiny devices, just like people running around on earth. Right? So for reference, one atom in this drawing um, on the wafer would be about 0.1 nanometers. And so that compares to 600,000 nanometers of bulk material. Very similar to that earth problem, right? Six million to one ratio in this case, right? So when we draw our devices, when we look at things, we often have to cross many, many different scales along the way and selectively zoom in, selectively draw rather than drawing everything perfectly like perhaps an architectural plan would be. Um, check the chat here. Right. Now, we're in the fab and we're in this yellow light space, which is actually where we pattern. But in the clean room, in a general fab, we have a number of different things that we do. We add materials. It's really is all about materials, right? We add them, we remove them, we modify them. And then of course, then we have to pattern them. We have to create some kind of design. Um, and at the end of the day, if we're not looking at what we're doing, we have no clue. So we also have to characterize. Uh, notice that, each of these broad categories comes with sort of subcategories, right? Removing material through etching, cleaning, polishing, and so on. But even a simple word like deposit can have many, many different physical, chemical mechanisms underlying it, right? Um, and so adding material is not just a single capability. There's many, many different ways we can do it. But in principle, it's all the same. We add material to the process. And we typically do this if you open up your cell phone, you look at what is going on. Well, it's a cycle of deposition, patterning, etching for removal. And that essentially gives you the ability to build things on the surface one by one. Right? 
um, and of course then characterize. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to do one of these cycles. And we're going to go through this um, to make our wafer because our wafer only needs to have one layer. Now, if we were to build a, you know, an integrated circuit, a computer chip and so on, we may need 30, 40, 50 of these loops, which is why we can't do this in the matter of you know, an hour and a half or two hours. But one layer that we can actually do. And so, um, like I said, we don't draw things to scale. This is what we will start off with. I actually have a box of wafers here. And I'm going to grab myself a pair of tweezers from next door here. And uh, I've skipped one step and that's the deposition part. And I pre-deposited this for us um, because it just takes a lot of time and it's not particularly exciting. So um, let me show you here as an example of a silicon wafer, right? Round, it has actually a small little cutoff here so you know which, oops, which direction it's at um, and it is fairly thin. Now, what I've done, rather than taking a plain silicon wafer, I've put on two films. I've put on a silicon nitride thin film and I've covered that with aluminum. So when we look at our wafer that we will be using, it looks really, really shiny because that is aluminum, right? The, notice this is silicon, it's kind of dull, it's gray, it's not very reflective. It's kind of a mediocre gray color. Um, on the other side, we have put down the aluminum, very, very shiny, very bright and reflective. And um, what I'm showing you here, this oxide nitride film, that is actually comes out as a very dark blue. That gives us that contrast that we would like to have. And we'll understand later why that happened. What we're going to do today is to take this material, perfectly uniform aluminum film, and we will write down our design into that. So what we're going to do is we're going to put down what's called photoresist, a temporary material that shields the aluminum. And we then use ultraviolet light to expose it, to pattern it. Um, and in doing so, we can selectively create a cover of photoresist on this device. And in doing so, it allows us to remove the aluminum uh, in a way that we want. So I'm gonna start off by that. So I'm gonna go off camera, off slides again. Now, um, in order to, to pattern this wafer, let me go. Um, actually, I wanna, before I go there, I just wanna show you the design that we have. So, um, how many colors can we create out of the aluminum wafer? Just one, right? It's aluminum. It's either there or it's not. So when, I, when you send me the photos, you send me a color photo with different grayscales. We have a bit of a problem, right? We can't translate that perfectly into the aluminum. It's either there or not. So we're going to simplify that whole layout a little bit. And I've converted the file so we can look at how that actually looks like. So this is our plan. Here's our wafer. Let me try to get on there. Oops. And I just noticed I didn't label it right. So we're gonna relabel it real quick. Okay, last chance for any secret messages you want on the bottom here, down there, other than a smiley face, anything else? So you can put that on the chat. Okay, bromine goes burr. Okay, good. Let's get started. So. I think my ugly script. And there we go. In the top, we want to call it, let's see, IP 2022 after nano. And then at the very bottom, okay, bromine, bromine goes. How many R's here? Are you, you, are you picky about the number of R's? I mean, I just do like that. How's that? Okay. Any, any other secret messages for you guys? Oh, okay. I think That's there perfect. were some others in the chat. Yeah. Got it. All right. Perfect. I, I have been ignoring that. Okay. So what's that? Let's see. What did the atom?
right. it's weird to type the joke and then realize it and then laugh about it. So it's all very delayed. <laughs> all right. Um, name, okay. Kua Botek. Okay, let's put that. At first, I, I didn't realize you guys actually put suggestions there. I thought you were chatting amongst yourself. So, <laughs> so Q A R. Did I spell that right? Hopefully. All right. So I got that. Um, I'm going to rerun the code. But while that reruns, we can actually look at these. Are, so this is our wafer. Um, and we got our message, our main thing here. We got our secret message there, and then four pictures. Actually, uh, two groups come in twice. And um, if I zoom in, this is how we implement it. Now, on the CAD software, it looks a little funny because it doesn't draw it perfectly yet. But um, right, so you can see that the pixels actually are it's just depending on the grayscale, we make larger or smaller chunks of aluminum. Now I've done two different ways. And let me go on to the bottom one first, because that's a little bit easier. Um, actually, sorry, the, the right one here. Yeah. Actually, no, sorry, I, I copied them identically. But if I go in, um, I did one thing. I did not pick blocks of aluminum, just random squares, because that is a little bit boring. So what I've done here is make little stripes. Now. The stripes are just a couple of microns apart. So you really can't see that they're stripes. Um, any ideas why I would be doing that? That looks just like making life complicated. So I have to think about that and then discover later why this actually happens and why we're doing it in this particular kind of peculiar way, right? Making more work for ourselves and, and what this could possibly do. Okay, so here's our full way for now. Um, Okay, IAP 2020, Fab 2 at Nano, good. Chromium goes for what did that? So, uh, okay, I think we're all here. Looks good. Okay, so. Now, before we, okay, before we get started, let me copy that file over so we have it. Now, this is 52 megabytes because we got a ton of random little rectangles that we throw all over the place. And, um, the next step, of course, is figuring out how do we get this design into the, onto the wafer. And um, first step is to copy it, I guess. Okay, I'll deal with it when we got other steps going on. I'll do it in the background. So um, let me roll us back into position. And now the, the fun is starting to, to begin, hopefully. Um, what you're seeing here are actually two of the tools we're gonna be using next, um, right behind where I was sitting. Um, so let me zoom out. And um, so what we're going to be using are these two systems. Um, before we do that, though, I want to give you a couple of more short slides to explain what it is we're going to be doing and, and why we're doing it. So you have an understanding and maybe an appreciation for what these systems do um, and how they're utilized. So the, the main challenge we have now, we got our design, but how do we put it onto the wafer? And we've talked a little bit about this photo resist and maybe it's UV sensitive, but let's be a little bit more rigorous about that. Um, so what I have here um, is really kind of my understanding or my, how I understand um, patterning in the, in the semiconductor industry. Right? It's really a combination of different things, materials, physics, and engineering. Materials, because we need to find a material that photo resist a material that changes when it gets hit by some kind of energy. Right? That's a materials problem. Once we have that kind of material, let's say something is sensitive to UV light, then we have to find the suitable energy source that is, allows us to create a pattern with it. Right? A big light bulb probably wouldn't work that doesn't allow you to create a pattern. So some kind of exposure tool. So this system here puts down the photoresist for us. The tool behind it that allows us to use a laser pointer essentially and write a pattern. Um, so those are our two things. And then of course, where's engineering come into play? Well, if I told you I have a laser pointer and I write a couple of million squares, um, it probably wouldn't work very well and would take very long, right? Um, so um, 
all of this has to be done really, really fast, right? Now, notice I have a put here in, in point two, actually, that there are often many different ways that you can achieve something. There's no such thing as the single only technique, many different energy sources, many different patterning techniques, right? So what you find is a, a whole range of tools across the, across the lab. And depending on what engineering on what, what constraints you're trying to satisfy, you may use different methods. Now, what is photoresist? This system will deposit it for us, but let's get an understanding for how do we build, find a material that is photosensitive, that is, allows us to do this. Right? So what it is, is essentially sloppily put paint, right? some kind of resin, some material that gives us a film that protects the aluminum. Remember, our goal is to protect the aluminum as we immerse it or submerse it into an etching to selectively remove it. So we need some resin, right? A layer of paint that is selectively applied. Paint comes in a solvent. So yes, there will be a solvent, right? So some carrier solvent with the resin that allows us to paint it on. And of course that then evaporates just like paint, we're gonna dry it. Um, and then of course we have to add that capability to be photosensitive. So a photosensitive compound gets added into the whole mix. And that is our essentially what is in the photoresist, right? If you look at a data sheet, for instance, much of it is solvent, some resin, and then a little bit of that photosensitive compound plus a couple of secret things, right? And the secret things usually just make the process perhaps more reliable, more stable, degradation doesn't happen so fast, et cetera, right? But in principle, you could mix it up yourself with the three core ingredient and you'd have something that roughly works. Now, what happens when I hit this material with UV light? Well, the photosensitive compound is the only thing that reacts. UV light splits it and gives off nitrogen. And this particular acid that happens becomes, uh, is now sol soluble. So we can dunk that into a base that's called developer and we dissolve this whole material out. So what happens is in the presence of this magical photosensitive compound, in the presence of it, we can't get rid of the resin. In the absence, once we've destroyed it through UV light, we can actually develop out or dissolve the resin out, right? This is what we're gonna be doing here when we apply photoresist. And now rather than using a paintbrush, which is perhaps what you do at home, um, on the silicon wafer, we wanna paint a one micron layer of photoresist, a very, very thin layer. But the only way to do this properly is to use a little bit more sophistication rather than a paintbrush, right? So we're gonna use something called spin coating. What it is is we drop liquids or we put film, the film onto the wafer and then we start spinning the wafer real fast. And in doing so, we get this really cool result. And I, I, I am always amazed by this because it is very counterintuitive to me. So, let me walk you through this. What happens if I were to put a big puddle of paint in the middle of a wafer and then I slowly spin it or fast, spin it fast, doesn't matter. What would you expect? Well, I would normally expect, I'd say, well, the center of the wafer wouldn't move fast. I'd probably get a whole bunch of stuff still there. And then the edges spin really quick and everything probably flies off. I would expect a very non-uniform film. In reality though, that's not what we get. And so this initial intuition comes from, well, I know about centrifugal forces. I know probably there's some kind of drag, some shear force that keeps the, the, the resist from wanting to run off. Um, but the one thing that is actually really cool is the paint drying process, the evaporation of that solvent. And that combination, those three factors combined actually mean that your speed at which you're or the, the resulting thickness is perfectly uniform, right? So we're kind of using physics here. I'm skipping obviously all how to derive this, uh, but we're using physics to paint, right? We're creating a perfectly uniform film that depends on nothing other than our speed at which we spin it on. So if I want it twice as thin, I quadruple the speed, right? So I have very good control over the thickness that way. And it's uniform throughout, you know, within a, less than a percent or better. So let's do this. Um, now comes the action part. Um, I'm gonna pick up our wafer and I'm gonna go into this 
spin coding system. This is actually, you know, when you're looking at spin coding in the laboratory, um, this is an automated system. This can run many, many wafers at the same time in power, sequentially, I guess, um, as opposed to a manual spin coder, which is usually a tabletop kind of device. Um, you know, think about it like uh, your kitchen blender at home as opposed to some massive food processing equipment, right? This is the big food processing equipment. Um, so I'm going to pick just one wafer, um, the one that we're going to write. And um, so let me show you. Here's our wafer. This is what we want. Notice again, aluminum is perfectly on top, right? Everything is covered by aluminum. Um, the way that these processes work, we have a cassette. So I'm going to put it into this Teflon cassette. And that's where the robot arms can pick the wafer out. So I'm going to bring you guys into position because when this runs, I want you to see how the whole process works. So I'm going to go here, load this up. And um, I have to make sure I got the right process conditions here. The way it's actually programmed, people call it recipes, just like cooking. So let me, uh, like that. there we go. So I'm just going to log in. Since it's an industrial tool, you usually have to log in because you're either a user or an engineer and operator. There's many different roles in terms of what you're allowed to do, perhaps. Um, and um, we have to tell it what to do. So I'm going to download the recipe, right, the conditions, and I tell it uses this particular material, spin it with these conditions and so on. Um, waiting for that to happen here. The reason that this whole strange process happens is this graphical interface is really just the wrapper around a control system. Right? So it dumps all that information into the control system. So now it's ready to run. Um, I better put the tweezers down, otherwise they're gonna start flying all over the place. Now. Um, let me show you actually from the side what is happening because that's where we see that's where we see what's going on. So, do not open window when operating. Good. So I'm going to open that. So it's okay. I'm not before. All right. I'm going, to, I'm going to position us because once this gets going. We don't have much time to look at it. I don't want us to be running around trying to get the camera in the right place. All right. It looks about right. So what I have here is up here, this is our wafer. Um, this is a robot arm that transports it around. We have a variety of different, so two towers here with um, uh, hot plates, a, a vapor oven that, that helps us get better adhesion on the very front here, hot plates, cooling plates, and then this bowl is where the actual spin coding is going to happen. So when I press the start button, you're going to start to see the system going. So one, two, three, go. Um, hopefully it runs. So the robot arm is now scanning the cassette. It's figuring out where are the wafers, which one should I pick? We only gave it one, so it's just going to start with that. Here's a challenge, actually. If you look at this robot arm, how does it carry the wafer? How does it not slip? Any thoughts? So one problem is in the semiconductor world, we want to keep everything clean, but that means we really can't grab stuff, right? I don't want to take my hands and grab the wafer. I don't want to have big, the tweezers are already kind of, you know, that's research in an industry fab, you wouldn't have that. So notice on this arm here that there's these little indentations, right? What happens actually is, when you're, unless you're in a vacuum, you're gonna use vacuum to pull things, to hold things, right? I can use a little bit of suction here to grab the wafer and then I can move it around fast, right? If we wanted to do a hundred wafers an hour, we gotta have these wafers whizzing through. And the only way to do that is to get a good grip. We can't hope that they won't slide. So what you're gonna see here is essentially vacuum suction, grabbing the, the wafers, moving it around. Um, and that's actually exactly what we're gonna be using for the spin coder down here. So once this is done, uh, we're gonna go to the, the cooling plate down there. Hmm, there we go, there. And then we're gonna transport it into the spinner bowl. And again, on the spinner, we're spinning at three, 4,000 rounds per minute quite fast. We again will use vacuum to hold things in place. 
Now I'm going to look at the uh, what the recipe tells me here. Okay, 30 more seconds in the top, and then we're going to take it out and start cooling it down. Okay. Um, now, typically at this point, if we ran multiple wafers, there would be another wafer getting picked up, put into an oven in parallel. And so we'd run multiple systems. The bottleneck really is that spinner bowl, right? That's the most expensive item. Um, it's a lot cheaper to put a little hot plate in, but the spinner with the automated chemical dispense and so on, that is a lot more complex. And so what you find is that that is essentially the part of the spin coder, everything else is support so we can have multiple hot plates, multiple ovens like that. Yeah, okay, seven seconds remaining. And so then let me go over here. Then we should be opening up. This actually closes because we got this a chemical vapor that, that essentially helps us get better resist adhesion here. Um, Now it goes in, grabs our wafer, again, holds it down with vacuum so it can move around without it sliding all over the place. I'm gonna put it onto that cooling plate because the top oven was at 100 and uh, I believe 130 degrees Celsius. You wanna cool that down for about 15 to 20 seconds. Um, and then we're gonna move it from down here over to the spinner. So I'm gonna go to our spinner already because this is the fun part. Okay. So wafer is about to go in. Um, that funny clamp helps us center it. If it's wobbling around, it's not good, it'll fly off. So we're gonna give it a little bit of a spin. This arm, that's where the photoresist is in. Now we're gonna dispense a drop of photoresist. So put a blob on and bang, off it goes spinning, right? So the spinning actually, you can't readily see this in zoom, but it runs at a variety of different speeds. You notice though at the edges here, how the photoresist gets flung off, right? We're spinning the excess resist. We put a lot of stuff on in the middle. As we sp begin to spin, the film thins, all the excess gets thrown off to the side. Um, that's the red paint essentially that you see at the, at the edge. Let me try to find how to coordinate my hand-eye coordination into the camera and zoom. Okay, hold on, there, there, there we go, that stuff. Yeah, that stuff, um, that's the excess photoresist. Um, and um, you occasionally see a couple of drips coming off. Right? So as it now spins, we're beginning to reach that equilibrium of, of um, centrifugal forces, the drag from the wafer itself and the evaporation. So that at the end of it now, we have a perfectly uniform one micron thin film. And we're gonna bake this, right? This, still has lots of solvents in it. Now we're gonna dry the paint, um, put it on a hot plate for you know, another 45 or so seconds. Uh, in this case, actually a minute. And after this, we have a dry film. All the solvents have been evaporated and we're ready to actually use this, this wafer. So as this runs, I'm gonna start copying our file over to the, uh, to the computer. So I'm gonna go off the screen here for a second. Right, so it's done baking. It now has put it on another cool plate. And um, when it's ready, I'm gonna put it back into a different cassette. Go down here, picks it up. Um, again, it's scanning. So what it actually does, it has little light sensors there that, that look at what reflects back. So it counts how many wafers are, are present. Right now it's all empty, so it puts it in the top slot. Right. Um, this type of system you'll actually have the whole principle in an industry fab, right? It's built to run these cassettes of 25 wafers at a time. Um, so it actually is quite, quite efficient, right? I can put things in, um, come back half an hour, an hour later, and everything is ready. 
right? So it allows me to actually be quite productive. So I'll pick up that wafer. Notice if I look at this, the color hasn't really changed. Um, and that's because we only have one micron of resist on top and it's a slightly red tint. So it's really hard to see, particularly in this yellow light. Now, remember this is UV sensitive, right? That explains why I am in yellow light and not in regular light. So it's kind of your old fashioned photography dark room, except um, we're a little bit lucky. We only worry about, about blue light and not, uh, not the full spectrum. Now to get this into position here, we actually should play a little guessing game, I think. Um, so on chat, I guess, here's, here's a, uh, this is the exposure tool that we're gonna be using. Um, she says a quick question. If I tell you this is essentially a really big laser pointer, how much money would you pay for it? Um, just think about, think about a number and on three, two, one, we'll all hit enter. Okay, so we know nobody embarrass, we all embarrass ourselves at the same time. So <laughs> how much money would you pay for a really big laser pointer? Three, two, one, hit enter. And we'll see what comes out of it. All right, we can certainly do some arbitrage here. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy it for ten thousand and sell it for hundred million. I think that's our range. Okay, so on average, you guys are right. This is about a half million dollars. Okay, um, why? Because we have that engineering component, right? The tool has to be fast, precise repeatable, so there's a lot more than just a laser pointer. I misled you by saying it's a laser pointer. It does have an eight watt laser inside, um, but let me load this first and then we can see what actually happens. So here's my wafer. Um, I have a little loading stage that I can put it on. And let me show you a little bit closer to what actually is inside because it's a little bit difficult to see. The, the big box is really just there to keep it at perfect temperature. But um, up here in this section, that is an eight watt UV laser. Um, right here is a, uh, a small aperture, essentially a microscope objective. So think about a DLP projector at home. Um, a DLP projector, you look at the movies, um, it takes light, runs it through the projector chip and then broadens it out. So here it's the exact opposite. Rather than broadening it out, this is your light source, you magnify it down to a small spot. And then you have a stage here that can run the wafer below it underneath it. Right? That's what we're gonna be doing. Um, I'm gonna close it because this enclosure here, again, designed to have constant temperature, even better than what the clean room would normally have. Um, and in order to get this going, I actually have to do one, one more thing. So we're gonna convert our design file now that I copied over. And one important thing is I don't wanna, you know, if you think about this, a, a very, very large number of individual shapes that we have. Um, and I don't wanna overload the conversion software. So I'm gonna simplify it just a little bit and then load it to the, to the conversion software. So I'm gonna have to do one more manual step here. And um, typically, um, you know, here's actually something to think about for you. Um, if I gave you a, a, a modern microprocessor, what happens here, hold on, layers. Wait, I may not be able to talk and, um, and work at the same time. So. I mean, let me just work on this before, before making a mistake. Um, in the meantime, as I, as I do the last steps of our data conversion here, think about how would you create the design of a microprocessor with you know, a billion transistors and each transistor has many, many different components to it. So the layout may have billions and billions of shapes. How could you possibly do that without creating you know, petabytes of data?
So if you think about it, if you have a billion transistors in the microprocessor, they're probably not all perfectly different, right? There's probably a lot of overlap. Um, and so actually what the way to solve this data problem is to say, well, let me create a hierarchy, right? Maybe I only have 10 different types of transistors, but I obviously put them together in clever ways to create AND gates, OR gates, adders, registers, and so on. So little components, and perhaps I'll take some of those little components and make bigger ones like chunk of memory, like something that can add numbers together, right? So you can see how this whole hierarchy um, in the microprocessor probably lends itself into recycling of, of parts, right? So that your 10, 20, 30 different transistors essentially get recycled over and over. Um, and you don't really need to have a billion of those written out specifically. Your layout can actually just be references to it. Right? And that's what we're doing typically in this field. Now, what I'm doing here actually now is to get rid of those references. Um, I actually have used a very similar approach because we have, let me make this, okay, good. Now that I can zoom in. When you think about it, we have all these pixels in our image here. There's 256 different pixels. So I don't have to create millions and millions of shapes. I can create 256 and then reference them. Um, right. So for example, this pixel here is identical to that pixel. So it's one reference, one reference, and then another one over here. Um, I've now gotten rid of this. So I turned this from a very simple description of put a bunch of pixels in to a more complex one, a more fundamental one, which is draw one rectangle here, another rectangle, another one, and another one. All right. So it's going to be a much, much larger file, but it's easier for the system here to parse and understand. So when I look at this, what used to be a model size 50 megabytes has now ballooned to 260 megabytes because I'm now describing every single shape. Um, so I'm going to go back to the go to my, uh, my tool here. I'm going to write a six inch waveform. All I'm doing is configuring it right now. Um, I will then have to convert my design. So whatever we just did, I'm going to create a job for that. IAP 22. And I call it nano IAP 22A. So I'm telling it load that design and then we're going to check it because hopefully we converted it the right way and we don't want to make a mistake. Good. Anybody have an idea how many pixels we have on, on, a, on a silicon wafer? So this system has a one micron resolution. So you can do the math, I guess, and you get with gigapixels, right? So the, the cool part is we have this design and we convert it into individual pixels on the wafer of which we have billions of, of small parts, right? So um, and this is why sometimes it can take a little bit. Uh, set up some parameters here. I just meant to make sure that I um, expose the full wafer. And um, it says I can open the viewer to our final check because maybe I made a mistake, I loaded the wrong file or I forgot something else. So let's see how that looks. All right, good. Right. It draws a little different from the from the CAD software that I looked earlier, but this looks good. Right here are our squares. Now it fills it in. Right. And um, so hopefully this will be an image we can recognize and we'll discover that later. Right. Okay, we're good to go. I'm gonna say complete the task. Double check everything. Good, good, good. I'm going to load my design and I am now basically almost ready. I'm going to tell it I'm using the photo disk with a certain parameter. Now I'm good to go. Back to the tool. Um, I'm going to tell it to load the substrate. And what I want you to see now is what actually happens inside the tool. So see kind of our wafer there. It's a little hard to notice it because 
we got this cover here and my camera that is uncooperative with the focus. There we go. So you guys can see the wafer on the stage where it says aperture here, there, I guess. Um, that's where the light will come out. And we're going to tell it to now load the substrate. What it does is actually it moves the light output or the wafer under the center of it. And one challenge that we have is where's the wafer located? Right, I just sort of randomly put it in there. Um, and actually what the system is now going to do is it has a little right head that goes down and it measures at what point is the wafer no longer there. So it moves back and forth, scans across the wafer and says, okay, wafer is here until now it's gone. So it can find the center of the wafer that way. Um, and so we don't have to worry about how exactly we placed it with precision. Okay. I got to be roughly on that stage and the rest is done by the system. But notice that this is actually a, a laser interferometer stage. So at the edges, um, so where am I here? Over there, which you can see is a mirror surface. So a laser interferometer gets the tool a very, very precise reading of, of where it is at. Um, and that's quite important because you want to be able to position and print the images in, in exactly the right place. All right, I'm all good. Um, I'm going to start the exposure. So once the exposure starts, we can think a little bit more about how this tool works. Now I'll go back to some slides, but um, as it is beginning, it has to do a little bit of data conversion, right? We just threw 260 megabytes of rectangles at the thing. Um, and so it has to figure out how do I take that, turn it into something that is actually actionable on the system, right? On off for my right systems rather than just random rectangles. So this can take actually a little bit of time, but here it goes, right? Notice what it's doing. Um, this is perhaps counterintuitive because you may have thought that, well, the system just moves into position, takes an image, moves further, takes another image and so on, rather than continuously scanning, right? So you see a continuously scanning here of the wafer across. And if we waited long enough, you'll notice that the wafer essentially gets scanned and you travel across the wafer that way. Right? So let me um, go back as this runs, and this should take about 10 minutes or so. Um, I wanna remind you of what it is we're doing in our process. So here we are. Go back to more normal location. There we go. Does that work? So we are now exposing the wafer. We're delivering UV light, and in doing so, exposing that photoresist, right? Changing its material properties so that when it is exposed, we can dissolve it and remove it. That selectively patterns um, the wafer. Now, how do we deliver that energy? Um, in fact, if we look at this tool, I kind of gave you a preview already, right? We have this eight watt, 400 nanometer blue laser and through a series of optics have essentially a projector chip here um, that then delivers the image onto the wafer itself. And the wafer sits on a stage, we can move it around and Eventually we have covered the entire wafer if we do this often enough. And we do this by meandering in, in these patterns. The really neat thing, what I really like about this tool, what's fascinating is that it does shoot many, many overlapping images. Because if you think about it, if I had to take a naive approach to building a tool, I would say, well, I can use the stage, move into the right place, position myself, and then expose it with one careful image. Then I'm going to move the stage to a different place, stop there, expose it with an image, and I keep going. If I did this, this would certainly work. This would probably be easier to do than what is being done here. But it has a huge drawback, and that is speed. Right? Building a mechanical device that moves and stops and moves and stops, right? unless you have really, really high acceleration, is probably not going to work. So rather than starting, stopping, starting, stopping, it actually runs all the time. 
And it's kind of like a, an airplane flying and you want to take pictures, right? You take short snapshots, many short snapshots rather than one long exposure. And this is what happens here. So we're flying over the surface of the wafer. And as we fly, we calculate, or the tool calculates, what image should I be projecting now? And then that's why it has eight watt UV laser. Then it creates a very short flash of that image onto the wafer, keeps moving to the next point and repeats all of that, right? That is essentially then where, where the engineering components comes in. And actually a wafer here gets exposed with 70 billion pixels. So imagine that in 10 minutes, the tool has to calculate 70 billion positions on off switches of that, that DLT projector, right? Um, that is pretty impressive. Uh, the degree of calculation that is needed and the real-time calculation, right? We don't want to sit here, wait five hours for it to calculate. It should write immediately and calculate everything in parallel. So um, like I said, right, we, we move around, we fire at exactly the right point um, with microsecond precision. Now, as this is running, um, I want to give you a little bit more of an overview of how we will generate color. Why is it that, well, okay, simple question, why is the aluminum shiny? Because it's a metal. Not so simple question, why is that oxide or nitride film blue or whatever color it ends up being? And so the answer to that is thin film interference. Soap bubbles, oil on the pavements, um, all of that is interference of thin films. Right? If I have light come in, what happens is, the light, if I have a very thin film of, let's say, a little bit of glass, a little soap film, whatever it ends up being, the light refracts on the surface here. Um, so bounces on the surface. Uh, some of it continues traveling and comes back from the substrate below. And that parallel combination either creates constructive or destructive interference. If it's a multiple of the wavelength, it would create uh, you know, obviously then constructive interference. If it's half off, it would be destructive, right? And that's how we can create different colors, right? For a certain film thickness, red might be exactly the right multiple of the wavelengths, constructive interference. I see lots of red come back. Green maybe is half off, right? So we get destructive interference and I see no green and that how, is how I have the color. Uh, we can put math to that, but it basically means the thickness of my film if that is a uh, related to a multiple of the wavelength, um, we'll have to throw in the index of refraction, but it doesn't really matter. This is kind of the, the core concept, right? Um, yeah. um, you can calculate this, but um, what I wanna show you here is um, an overview of this is why we chose the materials we did. This is not accidental. On the top, we have aluminum. Uh, silicon is here in the middle, right? This would be our normal point. Um, it reflects about half the light. Um, aluminum is great, 98% reflectance, 90% reflectance, so it's really, really bright. Um, that's why I chose aluminum as one of our two colors. The second color I've chosen was this very thin film of the combination, actually, in this case, of oxide and nitride, silicon dioxide, which is essentially kind of glass, um, silicon nitride, which is a different dielectric. That combination, and I've chosen the film specifically to give me that constructive destructive interference in such a way that the color looks as is shown here right, in purple. Really what it looks like is purple. Across the wavelength, almost nothing comes back. It almost looks black, except it has a little bit of a dip here in the blue and a little dip up in the red or rise on the red. And that gives it that very deep blue purple color that, that actually looks really nice in combination with the aluminum. So what we're gonna have here is the combination of aluminum on the top versus this purple line on the bottom, right? Dark purple. And so that gives us a very beautiful contrast. And that's what we need because we're gonna have to figure out, um, you know, essentially what we we're looking at small features that are not visible to the eye, but in aggregate, we wanna create that effect. So, that is our contrast. Now, now we come to the 
answer of why do I have these funny little horizontal lines? Um, anybody have a clue about why that may be? Any suggestions? Let me go back and. Oh, let me read the chat here. I've been. Move on. Yeah, this is exactly this is the Heidelberg. Actually, MLA 150 is this particular one. They have different varieties. The 66 is a slightly different mechanism. It doesn't use a DLP, um, but a, uh, a different optical modulator. But same fundamental concept, right? Um, so, how would I create even more contrast? I got this very dark blue. Let me go back to this this very dark blue purple and this very bright aluminum. Sure, I could say, well, let me find another material, maybe a metal that doesn't reflect 98, but 99% of the light. That's not gonna do anything. Let me find something that eats up more than, or less than 10% of the light coming back. Again, that's not much, right? We're almost maxed out on the amount of contrast we can get. There's nothing else we can do, except something interesting we can do, and that is to play with the layout, with our design. So how do we make something shine? How do we make the aluminum even brighter? And that is um, really about reflecting things, right? Um, so what we wanna have is what's called a reflective grating because you've seen this before in high-tech situations like, like here, splitting the colors of the light. Um, and then perhaps low-tech you know, situations like a, a beef rainbow, where you have essentially a grating on the structure of the beef that gives you what looks like spoilage, but actually it's just, just exactly the same thing we're doing here. What we're gonna do is we have little indentations on the wafer and those indentations give us again, constructive destructive interference of certain colors. So we have, and that's kind of something you know, right? From a CD, from pictures of computer chips, um, or like the image I've shown here. So we're gonna use that same effect to generate um, an aluminum pattern that now is able to reflect light at us if we look at it from the right angle. That is why on the image here, I had these, these gratings, right? The gratings act, give us some of that and give us these reflections as you see in this picture here, or as you see on the beef or in this, in this actual real proper diffraction grating. We have something that is similar to that, but perhaps not as sophisticated and not as finely, finely uh, defined. That's why our pixel was not a big box, but was this set of lines, because it allows us to generate that light effect that we would, we would wanna have. Um, it's particularly important because we wanna look at something tiny, right? So it better shine back at us, because otherwise we have no contrast, we don't see it. Um, so hopefully this will, this will solve our problem. To discover whether it does or not. Right. So I'm gonna give it, um, let's see, we got performance. How's everybody doing? You hanging in there or uh, do you need a break or? See, every time I, I, I ask a question, I gotta go back to the chat here. Okay, let's see, where is the video? All right, thumbs up, thumbs down. Are you still alive? Two people are alive, okay, good. Maybe more, all right, four at least, awesome. So while this wraps up and we still have a few more minutes of writing, I wanna actually take a little detour and tell you about particles. And I think we have enough time for that. Um, why am I dressed like this? Why is the clean room so complicated? It all has to do with particles. Right? Um, who creates the particles? And so this will be a bit more of a guessing game, a bit more interactive than, than some of the other parts. So I'm gonna try to find out if I can get to the, the chat here, get this set up. Let's see, chat, there we go. All right, so who creates particles? It's us, right? People and their activity. Um, and in fact, um, first guessing game, how many particles are you generating right now, sitting there, not doing much, just sitting on Zoom? So think about that for a second. Um, 
type the answer into oops, type the answer into the chat, but don't hit enter yet. Okay, so again, not to embarrass ourselves, other than as a whole group. Um, so how many particles fall off your body right now per second? And on a count of three, we'll all hit enter and we'll see what happens. Okay. So how many particles per sorry, not per second, per per minute? Three, two, one, enter. All right, so we're somewhere between 1,000, million, 100 million, 10,000, 5,000. Okay, not bad, right? Fairly broad range. And actually, the, the, what I want to highlight here is the, the range of values that we end up with. And there's a good reason for that. We don't really know ourselves. We have no intuition, right? Turns out if you create an experiment and count this, it's about 100,000 particles that you're dropping every single minute. That's sitting still. How about walking around, moving a little bit? That goes up to a million, perhaps up to 10, 20, 30 million if you're doing rigorous exercise. Right? So yes, yeah, so if someone asks you, why don't you do any sports? You can say, I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna contaminate my, my apartment or something. But uh, anyways, um, now where does all this stuff come from? Well, what do we have 30 million things of that we can just get rid of and not be bothered? Notice these are particles. This is not molecules. This is not air I'm breathing out. This is stuff, right? Hair, okay, skin cells, yep. So hopefully I'd be happy if I had 30 million hairs to get rid of every minute, but I don't. Um, we have skin cells. So we have about one to two pounds of dead skin cells that a person sheds every single year, right? This also explains why showering helps. It rips up most of the skin cells uh, that are dead and they don't end up contaminating or creating dust in your house. So those are solids. Uh, now with, with COVID and everything else going on, we also have become a little bit more aware perhaps of liquid particles. Um, so liquid particles, of course, can, that's the stuff we spew out. Um, depending on your condition, depending on how you breathe, uh, that can range between very little, like 50 particles to about 20,000 particles every single minute. Um, notice if I take a deep breath, I get a lot of air in the small parts of the lung and I'll breathe out a lot of particles at the same time. If I'm sick, I might be breathing out more, right? But notice that these are little liquid droplets, right? Rather than the solid stuff like the skin cells that fall off your body. And actually at MIT, there's some, some faculty, like for instance, the Berea lab that studies this and they've done some really cool videos and that, that really illustrate this. Now, the worst thing we can do, not just breathing particles out, is to sneeze, right? So here's a great video of a person sneezing in slow motion. What do we see? Here comes a burst, right? A flood of things. Big particles, small particles, chunks flying in all kinds of directions, big puddles of spit or strings of spit as well. It's kind of gross, but it shows you the range of particles that actually are being emitted. Right? This is not one unique particle. Liquids obviously are a lot more complicated, but um, you know, on average, you know, we worry in the fab about anything that is a particular, right? particles or, or solid or liquid. Modeling liquid particles is a lot more complex than modeling solids because the liquid particles can change through evaporation, et cetera. Now, let me take a step back. And so we know about some particles in the air and, or that exist. And um, perhaps we know how big the size, uh, the size of a sand pebble is. We probably know the size of a hair and maybe the size of pollen. Those are things we've actually seen, right? So if I had to put numbers at that, um, about you know, millimeter size for sand pebbles, 100 microns for hair, tens of microns perhaps for the pollen. But then we end up with this problem here. Um, and that is we have a lot of other stuff in the air that, that perhaps we don't know as much about. Cement dust, bacteria, tobacco smoke, makeup, carbon dirt, et cetera. Now you might say, okay, I've seen, I've seen tobacco smoke. And I would tell you that's true. You've seen it, but you've never seen individual particles of tobacco smoke. I know the aggregate behavior, the whole thing, but I don't necessarily know the individual unit component. So if you ask me, 
What's the size of tobacco smoke? I will tell you, I have no idea. Some things I may know, car emissions, I've heard about PM 2.5, so I might guess two and a half microns. Um, but on average, I really have no clue about any of this, right? Why? Well, think about it the following way, right? Most of these particles are invisible. Why? Because they're so small. And because they're invisible, we actually lack intuition about them, right? Something I've never seen, how am I supposed to know anything about it? It's impossible, right? Because I've never seen individual particles of tobacco smoke, I actually have no idea. Now, it's not all loss. We have some intuition, right? And we have that intuition because we can always extrapolate until we're proven wrong because we extrapolated too far, I guess. But here's our intuition. What falls faster, a grain of sand or a piece of pulp? Well, okay, I can kind of answer that Grain of sand will fall straight down, the pollen, I don't know, will sort of wiggle around, right? So I know intuitively that a grain of sand is gonna be much, much faster falling. The tiny pollen is probably gonna fall much, much slower. That's my intuition, but it's all qualitative, right? I don't have quantitative. I can't tell you five times as fast, a hundred times as fast, I have no idea. I could try to do an, run an experiment, but I only know this qualitative. But that's good, at least I know the direction. Turns out a 10 times smaller particle will actually fall 100 times slower. Uh, that's interesting. And if we continue this, we actually discover that dust settles quite slowly. And we know that, right? At home, you make a big mess, the dust gradually settles. Perhaps now in winter with the sun coming in from the side, you have seen the dust gradually settle. You see it you know, falling to the ground. So you get some appreciation for this, but again, nothing really quantitative. Now, if we only look at gravity, no ventilation, stuff just falling, we could say, well, if I go skydiving, eventually I reach terminal velocity. So maybe the particles as they settle also reach terminal velocity. And if that is true, how fast would they drop? So here's the answer to that. We can look at papers, we can look at, at, at models that people have made. And I'm gonna phrase it the following. If I have my pointer here and I drop it, how long will it take to hit the ground? I know that, right? Maybe a second, I don't have to try it out. For the particles, if we start with a millimeter here, it will take about 0 0.0001 hours to drop to the ground. Right? On the other hand, for a tiny particle, it takes a lot longer. So with that information, I can now derive some interesting conclusions. A 20 micron particle on this graph shows that it takes about a minute to drop to the ground. That's perhaps the order of magnitude of your dust particle. But a half micron particle, right? So dust pebble, big stuff falls immediately, pollen, maybe it will take a minute or so. Um, but a tiny particle, a little piece of carbon emission from your car, something else may take a day or longer. One number that you can remember, perhaps, because it's the easiest to remember here, half micron sized particle will take you one day to drop three feet. So it actually sits around in the air quite long. So if we are in a non-clean environment, we would have to worry about this. I'm spewing millions of particles out uh, you know, every hour and they would eventually land on my sample because they never have enough time to settle down. So a half micron particle takes one day to drop three feet. Okay. Notice also one other very interesting thing. This is why when you do nano research, you go from let's say half micron to 0.1 micron, notice this huge difference, right? One day becomes two weeks. So if I'm working on nanoparticles, nanotubes, stuff that is significantly smaller than hundred nanometers, I probably wanna do this in some kind of vented environment. I don't wanna breathe that in. Right. What am I missing here that, that you would be interested to know? When I made this graph, I drew this little weird gray rock there. I specifically didn't draw a COVID virus because the COVID virus is very, very small, but it lives in a blob of liquids and other stuff. Um, and perhaps as that dries out, viability gets changed. So 
for biological, biological things, it's actually a lot more complicated, right? In a liquid environment, living environment, it is a little bit harder to estimate, but solids and inanimate objects are actually quite easier to model here, right? Now, um, because of this, we dress up like I do here, or like the, the students in this picture, we dress up in a bunny suit. We cover everything, hold all the particles in, only our eyes poking out. That way, when I breathe, when I make a mess and moving around, it all stays and it doesn't enter the clean room. Right? That's quite important because otherwise we end up with a beautiful wafer like this that essentially has only one or two defects here, these little black dots. Um, this was the wafer that was built for a NASA mission that launched this, this past July. Imagine I came in with a big dust cloud, this would be all over the place and probably wouldn't really work well. Um, and you'd lose a lot of efficiency, jeopardize the entire mission. Right? And that's often because one defect can be, has an outsized effect on the, on, on the operation of the device. A tiny particle can create a very, very large defect. So we're gonna do some applied dirt later, but let's start with our, um, with our wafer first here and unload that. So coming back to our system, it just finished. I'm gonna tell it to unload. So stage is moving out. Now I can grab my wafer. So find my tweezers that I have misplaced on the trash here. There we go. I'm gonna open this up again and take my wafer out. Notice just like in the um, in that coda track earlier, this wafer, it moves around fast, right? But doesn't slide because again, it's held down in place by vacuum. So that's how that works. All right. Now, close the door so the temperature stays stable. And then we can go back and put the wafer in here. So our wafer has now been exposed. We have written our pattern on it. Can we see it? Well, we changed the chemistry on it. You see something, right? Yeah, okay, something is shining through. Um, we could leave it at this, but it would essentially be invisible, right? Let me go up even closer. There, there we go. Okay, so we know something was probably successful, um, but the reason we see it is actually that, that exposure changes the refractive index just minutely, um, obviously not good enough to call it a day at this point. So now comes the next step we have to develop it. So I'm gonna walk us around. Does anyone remember what we're gonna do next? We've hit the photoresist with UV light. We changed the chemical composition that D and Q chemical is now soluble in an aqueous base and so some kind of liquid. So I'm gonna to try to see, so take myself into position here. Aqueous base, so we probably have to go into some, some space that has liquid chemicals. That's what we're gonna do now. All liquid chemical processes in the lab, we do in, run in a fume hood so that we have, you know, any corrosives, anything else, we don't breathe that in, it gets exhausted. So um, as I do this and get ready to, to, to do that work, turn the lights on here. If I'm working in a fume hood, I gotta watch out, right? Chemicals, chemical safety. So the first thing I'm gonna do is put on a set of nitrile gloves. This is not, these are not highly corrosive chemicals like, or not toxic, toxically corrosive like strong acids, but I still, would certainly not want to get those on my hands and they actually are not good to get on your hands. So nitrile gloves, now I'm protected. And when I'm done with the processing, I toss out the gloves, right? So I don't accidentally touch chemicals and bring them all over the place. Okay, so I'm gonna need a dish to develop our wafer in. So I'm gonna pick Here we go. It even says develop, good. That's the dish that we're gonna put our wafer in. Um, got my wafer behind us. Um, what I'm gonna do is pick out 
the developer here. So we don't need much. I'm just going to put about an inch of this liquid in of this base. It's actually quite, quite strongly basic. It's pH of I think 13 or 14. So it's actually not 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 a benign type of chemical. Um, fill it in here just a little bit. I keep the bottle in the hood so I don't ever accidentally breathe anything in. Put it back to where it came from. And then we're ready to roll. Um, now, let me just quickly. I grab my pen. All right, so I'm going to go back to the slide to show you what it is we're doing because we're now at the next step. We've done our exposure. We're ready to do some action, but what is it? Um, we're right here. We have exposed the, the, the resist with UV light. We've modified the chemistry of that resist. And the step we're gonna do now is to put it into that developer and in doing so, remove the exposed photo resist and we're left with a pattern. So let me do that. I'm gonna take the wafer and toss it in. But before I do that, something else is missing. Removing the aluminum. Now it turns out we're using a little bit of a trick here. We are using the fact that this developer not only removes the photo resist, but it also attacks aluminum. So you're really doing two things in one step here, right? We're leaving it in, First, we're essentially waiting about a minute or so. In the first minute, the resist gets resolved, dissolved. In the next four or five minutes after that, the developer attacks the aluminum and cuts out the aluminum wherever the resist was not there. So we'll have to see how that goes. Let's see. So here's my wafer. Looks good, okay. I'm gonna get you guys into position because we don't have much time to see this because it all happens real quick. So sorry if you get dizzy with my camera work here. All right, there is our dish of developer. Let's see if I can get the focus to be moderately decent. All right, so as I put this in, watch what happens, okay? We got about a, there's a couple of points along the way that are interesting and they happen really quick. So you can't look away. I'll put this in, I shake it a little bit to get it in. What is happening now? Well, not much. But if I look at this, I'm starting to see an image forming. I might have to rotate this the right way. There we go. Here's our image. Okay. Now, it's actually, here we go. What's happening now is we're dissolving the photoresist. I'm actually removing the photoresist almost everywhere and only our image is remaining. Um, and um, good. Um, that was my cue to turn on the battery for the laptop. So what is happening? The resist is dissolving and I'm gonna ruin the whole thing now by shaking this, okay? Because really all that happened is that resist went up, just dissolves into the liquid and that redness we saw was a dissolved resist. It was not the image that we're creating. It was the essentially the exhaust of our process, right? Um, and you can see this, these clouds now from, from the resist. If I swirl it around a little bit, I'll eventually dissolve that away. So where we're at is, notice that we see an image primarily right now because we have that grading. So that, that, refractive grade, that reflective grading that we have actually allows us to see this. But everything now is almost aluminum. Almost everything is exposed, right? We got a little ring at the outside. We got our image that is, that is covered by photoresist and protected, but everything else is there. Now we've finished developing and we're beginning to attack the aluminum. 
you get about six or seven minutes for that to happen. Um, and what I want you to pay attention to here are a couple of different things. Eventually, if the aluminum gets thin, thinner and thinner and thinner, and it's only a few nanometers left, it no longer reflects light. It becomes partially transparent. So we'll actually see it disappear gradually. The last couple of nanometers, we'll see it just getting etched away. The other thing is in this to the tool that put the aluminum down for us, it actually fades out the thickness just a little bit towards the edges of the, um, of the wafer. Let me, uh, and just to be safe, I'm gonna plug in the laptop here so I don't run out of battery. Any improvement? Tells me it's charging, good. So, like I said, the edges, the aluminum is a little bit thinner. So if anything happens, we would want to see that closer towards the edge, right? So we're gonna be watching these corners here and we're gonna see if anything happens. Those are our signals that it's beginning to thin. And we actually can already see this. Notice at the very, very tip here, our ring, because I wrote this big circle around, our ring of aluminum is starting to show, right? It's no longer flat. It's starting to have some curvature. So that edge here is gonna recede, recede that way from, from the two corners, right? From here and from there, it's gonna recede inwards. Um, and actually I can see now, I don't know if you can follow me, but you see a little bit that ring starting to, to pop in now. Right? That's because the thickness of the aluminum there is just a little bit thinner. So it's just gonna run just a tad faster there and show up first. Now. Once we're done with this, I gotta get rid of the developers. I need a dish to actually rinse this. I'm gonna prepare that in the meantime. So I have a sink over here that you don't see out of view. And I'm um, just gonna fill a second dish with water. And when we're done, we'll take that wafer, put it into water and the water gets rid of the developer for us. We'll do some more extra rinsing and then, and then we'll, we'll have finished our design. Okay, so the ring is starting to show. We really don't know much about our image. Um, it still has you know, another minute or two, or three to go. Now, typically if I were to run this as a, a more controlled process, I would measure the edge rate. Right? And I might say how fast, how many minutes, I know exactly how long it would take. Um, the convenient part for us here today is we know when it's done, we can see it very, very visibly. If I were to make you know, micron or even submicron scale devices, perhaps I wouldn't use liquid chemicals, but even if I did, I would really wouldn't be able to tell, right? I wouldn't be able to look at it and say, it's done now. I don't have that kind of eyesight. Um, so we actually would have to do a lot more characterization of that process in order to get it um, to, to be reproducible and, and controlled. What is the benefit actually of, of using liquid chemicals? Right now I'm removing the aluminum. I've developed the resist. I'm removing the aluminum with the resist protecting parts of it, right? So that ring we see that is protected by aluminum, uh, but sorry, by photoresist. That's why it doesn't get removed. But the benefit of liquid chemicals is what's called selectivity. Developer only attacks the aluminum. It doesn't attack silicon. It doesn't attack the nitrite. So it's very, very easy to build something that is highly selective, right? The aluminum is gone and the nitrite is still perfectly there. The downside is that it's a liquid. It goes all over the place, right? We have no way to control the direction. Directionality is a big problem. So would I use this or would Intel use this to etch their 100 nanometer lines, wire metal lines on, the, on, the, on the, the latest processor? No, because 100 nanometers is too small, right? We use this because, oh, here we go. I'm gonna shut up and uh, let you watch this part. So now we have thinning down the aluminum. Notice it's beginning to be kind of cloudy. Just a couple more nanometers left. If I agitate it, I'll balance it out a bit better, but I wanna let it stay, right? So the aluminum is disappearing. 
<clears throat> and the last dusting as it goes means we only have the nitride left. It's kind of cool because you're looking through like a few nanometers of aluminum here, right? This might be five, 10 nanometers of aluminum and you see it vanishing in front of your eyes, right? In a very gradual way. Okay, that's it, right? So now all of the parts I wanted to dissolve have resolved. I can shake it a little bit in case there's some imbalance, right? But now what do we see? We see our images, we see our text, I didn't mess up the text, that's good. Um, I didn't take a different group's image from a different semester, okay, good. <laughs> you guys are all there. Um, and the image is there, we're done, right? We have nice contrast, we see the aluminum very clearly, we see the nitride is nice and dark as we had hoped to. Um, so next step, let me roll back. We gotta rinse and stop this whole process, otherwise eventually, this photoresist will eat everything else up and all the aluminum gone. Right? So I'm gonna take this, give it a quick rinse. And then I'm gonna put it oops, into my water. And I'm just gonna let it sit there for a second or two um, as, we, uh, as I start cleaning up. Okay, you probably are wondering why why are we dumping everything into the drain? Are we crazy? Um, we actually have an acid waste neutralization system in the basement. So that takes care of, of the waste that is being generated from this kind of process. So yes, we put it into a drain, but it's a very special drain that goes to a, a big system that looks at what comes in, neutralizes the acids or the bases, um, and therefore takes care of it. All right, I'm gonna take my tweezers, rinse them off a little bit too. So now this was in water. Now we got rid of all the developer. I can rinse it off a little bit more. And then our wafer is finished. How do I dry this? It's wet right now. I need to somehow dry this off. Um, great way to do it is to blow dry it with nitrogen though, not, not dirty regular air. I could wait and hope it drips, but what I do is I'm gonna blow nitrogen on the top. And then I could wait and the water would slowly drip down. Well, you guys can't see this, so you have to believe me, I guess. I'll get just a little closer and see if we have a chance of seeing anything. It's too, probably too dark. You can see the water line there a little bit, right? That's where the, up here is where the water is below and above it's dry. And I just keep essentially pushing that further, further down. And in doing so, I create a very pristine, clean surface. All the water is gone. We have actually automated systems that do it for us, but you know, that process is it's better, but it takes 10 minutes and this is perfectly good for our, our purposes here. Do the same on the backside, get rid of all the water. I really want one of those at home to dry dishes and things, but I'm not sure if I can afford a nitrogen tank outside. All right, it actually has a little bit of wetness still on it, a little bit of here and there. And so I'm gonna move it over to the outside now. Um, just briefly over there where I can dry it off a bit better. So, all right, so here's my wafer. I got a little fab wipe and I have another nitrogen gun right here that I can use. Now think about what, what is on this wafer right now. We have, we have our nitrides, we have our aluminum, what happens to the photoresist? It's still there, right? We haven't gotten rid of it yet. So we need a way to get rid of the photoresist because otherwise it just sits there. And even though it's very, very thin and almost transparent perfectly, it still would impact our 
aluminum reflectivity, right? It wouldn't be quite quite nice to leave that thin red layer of paint there. Um, we kind of have to find a way to, to remove that as well. And so this is now where we're gonna have to go on a little trip again. Clean up here. Let's see. What you don't see me doing right now is I'm gonna check everything. The bench looks good. Everything is dry. I'm gonna to toss out the nitrile gloves now that I'm done chemical handling. And, um, and then we're ready to roll. So we're almost done. Um, we got a couple of more small things left to do. We're gonna look at the wafer, look at it under the microscope. We're gonna get rid of the photoresist and then we're gonna mount it at the north west corner near the outfinet so you actually can see it if you if you're showing up um, you know towards building 13. all right so let's go on a journey here again let me just double check with my laptop will survive the trip all right what i'm going to do is i'm going to grab my wafer and as we roll um we're now discovering a new process method that we haven't used before um, and that is plasma processing. Now the trouble with plasma process tools, we don't really see what goes on. Um, but what happens is rather than doing things in air, we're gonna do things in a vacuum. Hmm? Yeah. Yes. So I'm gonna roll around the corner. The first time we get out of the, out of the, the red light, orange light here, yellow light, I guess. Um, and we're going to use this kind of tool. Um, let me try to find, zoom in, okay. Autofocus hates the brightness today. There we go. What this system is, is a plasma system. What you see where it says hot, that is a chamber. In it, you flow oxygen, you generate a plasma, it's in vacuum. You dump an RF power and it ionizes the oxygen. And in doing so, allows you to essentially rip um, the oxygen into, into shreds, into ions. Um, and the ions, of course, are then a lot more reactive than just pure O2. Um, the light that goes on there actually helps heat things up a little bit. Um, it's running right now, so we're gonna do this in a little bit. Um, and we're gonna look at the wafer photo for now and then just see what actually happened to our device. So let me go back. I got the microscope right here. There's our wafer, I put it on. Um, I go under the microscope. Start to focus. Now, um, in the microscope itself, I actually see, um, let me go a little closer here. There we go, here's our screen. Good enough. Um, let me start focusing. Right, this is at the lowest magnification. All right, we made it, right? It doesn't look so bad. Um, this is at 5X, you start maybe, right now at 5X, it still looks like just big square pixels. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit. Let's see, who are we looking at here? Who recognizes themselves? This is hard, right? You don't really know from, from this image. Maybe you recognize, okay. Let's see, who, does anybody recognize themselves? Let's look at the, uh, where are the chat? Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and in doing so we lose some of the big picture that we have, right? And we, but I'm gonna focus on one single pixel here or a couple of smaller pixels. Now we're beginning to see like what we hope to have gotten out of the layout. The camera has to focus, but these are the pixels that we have, right? Each pixel is, a series of lines that gives us that strange reflective grading that we're looking for, right? However far away, it still looks kind of like a big shiny dot, right? Big pixel, lots of reflection, smaller ones, less reflection, right? Bright going towards dark over here. Now, if I were to take this wafer out and show you a little bit closer now, actually, you know what? I'm gonna put it down and then I can Carefully zoom on it. Okay, hold on. 
camera wants to roll away. Okay, there we go. Now I got to focus. There's you guys. All right, so we kind of get the idea of the image, right? Notice that that refractive, reflective grading doesn't always show up, um, but it depends on the angle, depends on what we're doing. So perhaps, not sure if I get lucky with this. If I were to take my, here we go. But it depends on where the light comes from, you can start to see, right? This is our grading in action. Right? When I shine light on it, we get that, that color change. Now, if I were to take this wafer, this is really hard to do over camera, but if I were to take it and take a photo of it at the right angle, I would actually be able to capture this a lot better. Right? But on camera here, this is very, very hard because I have not enough degrees of freedom perhaps, but you can kind of get a sense for it now, right? So here now the, the ceiling lights refract on it and you start to see the different colors. Right? This is where we increase our contrast, right? Because we're adding, we're essentially getting ceiling light bouncing back at us from some odd angle, right? So, all right, so I think our, our plasma tool is free. I'm gonna move over here. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this in. What the system will do, we have a little bit of photoresist on it. And um, let's see, what is the recipe we have? takes about a minute or so to remove that photoresist. We're gonna run it on just one wafer and there you go. So robot arm grabs the wafer from it, puts it into that chamber. It runs at 250 degrees Celsius, so it's very hot. And then it dumps a lot of oxygen, rips it up into ions and, and reactive species that then attack the photoresist. Photoresist is carbon based, right? It was this resin stuff. So anything carbon gets eaten up by the oxygen and the reactive oxygen. And that's that eating up all of that uh, resist. The magic is it doesn't attack the aluminum and it doesn't attack the silicon nitride. So we selectively remove it but in a very, very quick way, right? Through heat, through reactive oxygen, all of that happens in a vacuum because if I wasn't in a vacuum, I'd have the problem that there's too much stuff in the way, right? All my reactive ions would probably not make it to the surface. Um, so it has to be actually in, at very low pressure. So you let the reactive species do their job. And that was it, it's already done. It's cooling it down on the, on the side over there um, and then it gives it back to us and then we're ready to figure out what to do with the wafer now what i'm going to do with the wafer is hang it in the uh, corner so we're gonna have to travel over there but okay wafer has come back we're good to go i'm going to take it out the most important part not now is not to drop it. Um, and then let me, uh, let me start rolling. I wanna do one, oops, uh, drifting off. Okay, too, much, too many things in my hand. I'm gonna go on a little bit of a detour here because this is fun. Okay. Um, I'm going to set my wafer aside. And um, so earlier when we talked about particles, this was all theory. Now comes the practical part. Uh, what I want to do is actually test out particles. And the way to do that is to have a particle counter. So here is just my camera. There we go. This is a particle counter. Big box. Um, suction air over here analyzes it with a set of laser beams and then splits it into different sizes and basically looks at gives me a report that says 10 micron particles that many five micron particles or larger that many and so on up to 0.3 microns 
so I can get a sense for how dirty something is. And I can actually run experiments like what happens when I misbehave in the clean room, right? And that's very valuable because again, we have no intuition about particles, right? The only way we can figure this out is to actually run these kind of experiments. So I have it set up to suck in a cubic foot of air and then reset itself. So right now we got a couple of particles. The clean room standard actually is 100 particles per cubic foot or less. So as long as that number reads less than 100, we're good. This is what the clean room was designed to be. It read about 20 or 30, so it's actually quite clean. But imagine now that you know we've built our wafer and I'm so excited and I, I just applaud the wafer. Let me see, once it counts down to zero again. So I'm gonna clap at my wafer. That was great, good job. And what happens? Let me stop it here. Right, that was 700 half micron particles that came off my gloves or my hands or somewhere, right? So how I behave in the lab certainly makes a big difference, right? Clapping them, my hands generates all kinds of particles um, that fly off. So I probably don't want to do that in the presence of samples or near, near pieces of equipment. Another good one is my cell phone. So how dirty is my cell phone? Well, here it is, hold on. Hold it over the particle counter. Oh, it's super clean, look at that, sparkling. Um, except of course that's in steady state, right? But what if I do this? What if I take my cell phone, here's the speaker. Oops. Okay, what happened? I had 7,000 chunks of stuff dislodged. But one important thing to notice is the distribution. 6,700 big stuff of 10 microns and more, right? Almost nothing small, right? There's the difference between these numbers that would be the size. So yeah, 7,000 things of 0.3 or larger, but 6,700 of them are bigger than 10 microns, right? Massive amounts of big stuff coming out of my cell phone. Okay. Um, one other test I wanna do is I wanna breathe into it a little bit uh, because it's a very different distribution, All right? This is kind of fat particle heavy. And this one here, I one breath into it. Notice in the clean room, I'm wearing a mask, right? So nothing big should come through. And that, that is correct. Only small particles came out, right? A, because my breath is perhaps, has a natural distribution to be more smaller particles. And then B, of course, that perhaps the mask helps protect some of the big particles from coming out, right? Um, and in fact, the whole debate about how to wear masks is something that in the clean room we're very well familiar with because you know, for many, many years, students and users and everybody, a, a big favorite, let me see, put my camera back in shape here. One, I'm gonna get you guys dizzy. There we go. This is untangled. Um, this is the proper way to do it. Okay, fine, I should really properly set this up, right? Eyes only. This is a lazy way to run around in a clean room, right? Nose out, not a good idea because again, I breathe out particles through the nose, right? So this is the proper clean room attire. And it was kind of amusing to see that in the last two years, that same debate happened outside the clean room. So that was, uh, I was curious. All right, so one final thing I wanna do here, we have a little bit more time. I wanna tell you actually, let me ask you guys, do you wanna take a quick discursion to the rest of the space or should we hang up the wafer and get out of here? No reaction. Let's see, I'm gonna find my pen and then I'll come back. I lost it again. The downside of these tours is that I leave stuff all over the place. And I don't remember where I put it. So here we go, I got my pen back. Okay, so what I wanna tell you we have been in this clean room, you haven't really seen very much. And we're gonna, we're gonna go to a particular piece of equipment over here, actually two pieces of equipment. Um, and I wanna show you the, the, give you a sense of appreciation for the complexity because we've seen only the lithography equipment. We have not really seen the most complex types of tools. So if you follow me through here, now we're going into the support space. We're allowed to do this because we're 
staff, I guess. So you're following me. All right. What do we got? We'll start over here, right? This was the Asher that we just used, the big box. Really can't see what's going on, right? But you have pumps, you have exhaust, power coming in, cooling water, all kinds of utilities. Um, we can see this even better with the neighboring equipment. So this system here is actually a dry etcher. It's a lot more sophisticated. A lot more sophisticated than the plasma asher. The plasma asher is kind of a brute force, eat everything up kind of tool. This is a system that you might actually find exactly like that in industry, building semiconductors um, over many different types of generation, right? And this tool here actually can do very, very precise etches very, very well into the submicron region. Um, you also notice it's a lot bigger than the Asher, right? This is the tool, it's kind of small, but it's got all the support equipment around it. And in fact, that is a very important realization in the past. In the microelectronics world, you have, let me see. Did I go back where my zoom disappeared? So this is normally where we're at, right? I have a, I'm, I'm as a user, I'm at the Asher, I press a button, I mumble some equations and I'm done. What I normally don't see, but what we actually do see at MIT Nano because we have windows so you can look in what's behind the scenes is the backside of the tool. That's this component here, uh, perhaps some pumps. Now, the cool thing actually on the first floor, we got a whole basement underneath that is non-clean space and we can just plumb everything down to the basement, right? That is called the subpath. So it saves up space. We don't have to have a whole bunch of big pumps filling up the floor here. Um, so we got pumps, um, exhaust. We have, you know, obviously all the process gases have to go somewhere. They got to get cleaned, scrubbed and, and made safe. Um, temperature, humidity control above me in the clean room, power, data, cooling water, clean air, all kinds of utilities coming in. Much of that actually happens in the basement, the preparation of it. So large clean water plant is in the basement. A lot of air handling on the, on the sixth floor of the building. Gas deliveries, right? These etchers run on a range of different gases, whether that's chlorine or fluorine types of chemistries or other kinds of gases, right? Oxygen for our ASHA, for example. So you can see this whole complexity that, that happens. And if I were to go one level up, just right above me, is where all the utilities come together, right? So what I'm having here in this picture, I'm, I'm in this space on the first floor. What I'm, if I wanna look at what goes on right above me, this is what it looks like, right? Essentially a large bus of utilities of different kinds of exhausts, different gas lines, cooling water, all kinds of other things getting to the tools from above, right? Um, and in fact, the building is very, very complex in that it delivers all of these utilities, even though we don't see them here in the clean room space, right? On the intermediate floors, we have all of that lined up. And so <laughs> essentially that is what you're seeing here is a CAD drawing of just the supports infrastructure for the clean room space. No tools, just getting power, water, air, gas, exhaust, chemicals into the right place. In fact, if I go up to the sixth floor, there's this is, is an image of the uh, of the uh, air handling systems. We got about a little over 10,000 hardwired input outputs, over 200, 392 controllers or servers that run the rest of the building. Um, so it gives you appreciation for the complexity and the industrial scale, perhaps. Oops. We have exhaust, right? The fume that I was in exhausts air. The tools exhaust air. We clean the air and exhaust things. We often need very, very clean water and air and we blow out a lot of air. And so that requires us to make up the air. And what happens there, see, yeah, I'm still good. Um, so what happens is we require to take a quarter million cubic foot of air into the building every minute. This is an example of that. Right? If you're on campus, you're outside MIT Nano and you look up, 
that sea air intake is seeing, right? Four million cubic foot sucked every minute up into the into the building. Down in the basement, water treatment system, uh, backup generator in case of power outages, so you can run the life safety in the critical systems, the pressure radiation of the clean room, et cetera. Um, and so that's it, right? Um, what I wanna do now is walk back, um, we'll figure out what to do with our wafer, right? So, yeah. all right, so let me find, I left our wafer somewhere over there. So let's go back to it. And let me just check that I got, okay, we got enough battery, good. At some point we don't run out of battery, I'll be, you know, they're gonna give me a minute to come back, but I think we're all right. Okay, where have I left our wafer? Right here. So I'm now in the, again, on the first floor, here's our wafer. We're gonna have this plastic cover. I'm gonna drop it in there. And then we're gonna sneak through behind the elevator and mount it right there. So for orientation purposes, this is where we are. Um, so I'm gonna look out the window a little bit as we walk. This is, hold on, camera straight here. This is the first floor lobby or first floor entrance into the MIT Nano space north, what's this, northwest corner. Um, there's a clean elevator. We have actually not explored. Yeah, that's fine. Um, no, just a tour. <laughs> so we have not explored, people always get confused when I'm running with this contraption here. We have not yet explored uh, the third floor, but it essentially is a similar copy. It has actually a lot more tools on it. Um, because a lot of the smaller tools ended up uh, being first place on the third floor. So what I wanna do now is mount the wafer. So you can see a couple of old wafers already from previous tours and we're gonna add ourselves to that. So I got this plastic cover, I'm gonna drop the wafer in here. And um, here we go. I got some suction cups. We're lucky that we're in a clean room because that means the window is clean and um, the suction cups actually last as opposed to dropping off, you know, I don't know, three weeks after we put it on. I had one of them fall off at one point, but it didn't break the wafer, so that's good. Good news, although I wouldn't count on it indefinitely. All right, how's this? All right, so this is where you guys are. Um, you'll find yourself, you stop by tomorrow morning, um, a little easier to see. And during daylight. Now, if you wonder what to do here and what to do next, um, I'm gonna actually while we while we're in this space, this is a very large industrial tool that is being moved in. So we haven't hooked it up yet. This is just the body of the tool. Um, this is actually what you would find in a production facility, right? So a large robot arm system in the middle, multiple different chambers and a shuttle that keeps moving the wafers back and forth. Control systems, pumps, all this plumbing will still come into the clean room here. So this is not, not ready yet. We just moved the body of the tool in from, from a different building. So this is gonna be very exciting when it's done and ready because it's a very complex system. Now, one, one, couple of, one slide I wanna do PowerPoint giving me hard time. Just at the very, very end. Um, essentially what we've done today um, is similar to the kind of fabrication processes you may be seeing in, in industry. Um, and um, hold on, there we go. If you're on campus and you wonder what's next, uh, there's a couple of things that you can do. Right? You can choose two routes. Um, you can take a nap in the East lobby, which is open, certainly a good choice. Um, or you can take one of the fab classes. We got 6152J coming up this spring. There's also a 
very new, exciting class in the fall. So that actually allows you to be in the space, operate the tools yourself. Eventually this one went up and running, but um, really allows you to, to design things and be here. So it's actually beyond just what we've done today. The fundamental principles of what we will be doing there is actually very similar to, to what, what, uh, what you've seen here today, right? That loop of the position, lithography, etch, measurement, that's really the core of every single microfabricated device regardless of the type of purpose that you have. Okay. So just an example. And, and really one thing that I wanna emphasize here um, is at MIT Nano, we have the classes that come through here essentially are very broad. But you see this in the 652 class from last spring um, where we had students ranging from freshman year all the way to PhD, eight different departments. And that's really, not just the classes, also the graduate students, the research that goes on here is very interesting in the sense that it comes from all over the Institute. It's not just a single one department, right? So that interdisciplinary nature actually makes it quite fascinating. Right? And hopefully you've seen some of that today because we've done materials, we've done chemistry, we've done physics, engineering, all kinds of things coming together to make that device work that we now hung up um, on, on the west, Northwest corner, right? So, with that, I want to thank you for the attention and uh, hopefully you've learned something today. Um, had a good time. It's always, I'm always appreciative of the fact that you guys are still awake because two and a half hours or so is quite a long time to be there on Zoom and not, not zone off. So uh, thanks a lot. If you have questions, I'll stick around. Um, otherwise, enjoy the rest of the evening and have a very good last week of IAP, I guess. <laughs>